Hello, my name is Deacon Albert Hudgens. Uh, <clears throat> I had a script prepared, but I'm not going to read it. Uh, the reason I'm not going to read it is because this is a young man. I can call him a young man because I'm an older man. <laughs> this is a young man that I see that is doing the things that all young black men should do. He's a strong father. Uh, listen at all the words that Pastor, that Pastor had just got done preaching on just a few minutes ago. Made me realize that we need more men being strong fathers and reaching out to our young men. Now, Tony Joliffe, I don't know a lot about him, but I met him last year uh, in an omelet shop here in Grand Rapids. First time I ever laid eyes on him. And, and I see him again, and, and he's still doing the same thing that he was doing then, and probably was doing way before I met him. So I honor this, this man because if a lot of our men would do what he's doing, over 50% of our men wouldn't be in prison. They would be raising their children. So all of the script that I was going to read about him, his educational background, where he's from, and all of that, I'm going to let him do that. But I just wanted to say to him that I applaud him for what he's doing, and I applaud him for being an example and passing out the kind of information that we all, all our men need to hear as far as being strong fathers. Because, you know, there, there's a lot of dads, but it takes more than just a dad to be a strong father. So I want to present to some and introduce to others Tony Joliffe. It's all great. Yeah, I'm going to bring that down. I'm, I'm at home too, just like Pastor Evans just said. So this is, this is a great place to be. Uh, last year when I came, <clears throat> um, you know, I looked very, very, very much forward to coming back. And it was just a great time. And forgive me, I'm a little hoarse. I've been under the weather for a little bit. Enemy's trying to stop me. But we know that he has no place in our lives. I spoke at um, Burton Middle School for five hours straight, pretty much, to five different classrooms. And he really tried to tax me and said, you know what, I'm going to get up and I'm going to keep on going. All right. Uh, I know Judge Logan's not here to tell me to leave at, at exactly 30 minutes. So, but I'm still going to honor him and still make sure, because I know he's going to probably make sure that I did get done in 30 minutes. Uh, first, I want to give honor to the head of this particular body of Christ. He wasn't here when I was here last year, uh, but the one time that I did hear you speak was when I came to one of your men's meetings, and I, I, I just, when I walked out of there, when I got home, I told my wife, I said, I like him. <laughs> I like him a lot, and I just told Jerry the same thing when I was sitting over there. I said, you know, I, I like him a whole lot, you know, and hopefully one day you and I can sit down and, and, and have some dialogue. Tony Jaliffe is my name, um, it often gets, mispronounced, but it's Jaliffe. Tony is just fine. I'm just as plain as anyone else that you'll ever meet. Uh, I work, I have this uh, fatherhood initiative, Strong Fathers. I work for the Grand Rapids African American Health Institute. Anybody that don't know me personally know anything about the Health Institute? No? Okay. Well, the institute started about nine years ago here, and it was, it was uh, originally started to challenge some of the health disparities in our community, the black community and bring awareness and we, we, um, we specialize in research and, and, and education. So I'm going to get started and I'll go more into that. I'm the fatherhood coordinator and some of the things that Pastor Troy talked about when he got up here, if we was already in line, I was going to let him know, I went to Israel with him. He didn't know that though. <laughs> I went with him on Facebook. You know, I follow him on Facebook and everything he did and everywhere he went, I was right there. I was glued right in. I haven't been to Israel yet, but I felt like I was there. Then when he, come, when he came here and spoke about it, he just made it that much more real to me. 
So look them up on Facebook and follow some of the stuff you do. That is church, I mean, that's phenomenal. And I'm gonna kind of touch into a little bit of that because me and him is on the same page in, in a lot of those areas. Um, also here, he, he said something about the deacons. I, I had a comment for the deacons last year. I'm gonna leave y'all alone. All right, so he already kind of got at y'all about that. <laughs> but our walls are burning and the, re and the responsibility is ours. And it starts with us as fathers. The unique, th unique thing about a strong community is that in this community, we all have our own little corner of work to do. But a place like Messiah brings us all together under one roof, and it kind of gives us a chance to pull it all together. And I, I work hard to make sure some of that happens. I try to meet with different people in this community um, just to sit down and talk, just have dialogue. We don't have to have anything come out of the conversation. Just, just sit down and talk with me and just get to know each other on a personal level. If we get to know each other on a personal level, maybe we can work towards something. So I do that a lot. But this is my mission. My mission is to seek, uh, I seek to strengthen families in our communities by encouraging fathers to play a more active role in nurturing, not just raising, but nurturing their children. Our purpose is to, uh, purpose is to improve fathers' ability to be fully and positively, actively involved in the lives of their children. That's my mission. I've been on that mission for a very long time, but I, I started that mission here in Grand Rapids just over a year and a half ago. When I first moved here four years ago from Detroit, Michigan, um, it was a little different. I worked for the Grand Rapids Public Schools, which was a great opportunity to learn about Grand Rapids through the children. You can learn a lot from the, from the adults, but you learn more about the city through the children, because they're going to tell all your business. <laughs> they're going to tell everything about you. I mean, they're going to tell, tell me things that they're not even verbalizing. I can just tell by the way they come to school in the morning. Right. I learned about Grand Rapids. So you think about that, all right? We're going to talk about that missing link. And that missing link is us as fathers. Mm. Pastor Troy Evans talked about this just a moment ago, but that information has been updated. 76 percent. African-American children are being raised by a single mother. 76%, two out of three. Our mother's doing a great job. I'm gonna be honest with you. I was raised by a single mother, but something profound my mother said to me, and it sticks with me, and, and the ladies can get mad at me if you want, I'll tell you where my mother buried at in Detroit, and you can go yell at her. She said she couldn't stand when she heard a single mother say, I'm your mother and your father. She knew she couldn't replace that part of my life but she still did the best thing she could do. She connected me with people in my community. She went to my family from business owners. We had a few small business owners in our family to the, to the street thugs, okay? Help me mold this child into a man, okay? She didn't say she was my father. She never said it, and I still kind of stick with that today. I, you, you can't be a father. You know, you can be the best mother you can be, and the same thing go for a single father. You will never be a mother, but you can definitely be the best father you can be. All right? These cute little faces, who could just walk out on them? All right? 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes, nine times the average. According to the Department of Justice, 58% of female prisoners came from a single mother household or lived with another parent. Those numbers are, again, the walls are burning, just like Pastor Trey Evans said. When you look at these numbers, you know, that made me alone want to move. I want to do something. I want to see something different. And Grand Rapids is where God brought me, because I'm going to tell you guys right now, I didn't choose Grand Rapids. I'm a, I didn't even know Grand Rapids existed. <laughs> Sorry. I know y'all been here for a long time and probably like ready to throw me out right now. I didn't. I grew up in Detroit. I used to come over to Muskegon. I used to go up to Big Rapids, up to Ferris State, uh, Ben Harbor, Kalamazoo, uh, 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 Battle Creek, Jackson. I came through Grand Rapids one time, stopped off at 131 and got some gas and kept on going. I was like, hey, no black people there. I'm like, what I'm gonna stop there for? <laughs> You know, that should have been my sole reason, but I just didn't know. You know, that was my ignorance. I didn't know. I come from what I call the chocolate city, the real chocolate city, Detroit, Michigan. 85, 90% African-American. All I seen was black folks my whole life. 
You know, so I didn't think we were nowhere else. I didn't think we could be anywhere else unless, if we wasn't in Detroit, we weren't nowhere. Except Muskegon. <laughs> Except Muskegon, all right? But um, just growing up in a, as, 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 a, as a single, from a single mother, and her pouring into me, I knew I wanted something different for this community. And our goal, my wife and I, we, we moved to um, Memphis, Tennessee, before we, when we left Detroit. We stayed down there 300, anybody here from Memphis? Okay. Where did y'all black folks come from? <laughs> Is it Georgia? Alabama? Mississippi? Y'all just wasn't born here. Somebody came here and brought y'all here. <laughs> I know when you go to Detroit, majority of the black people are from like Mississippi or Alabama. And then in Georgia too, you know, but a lot from Mississippi. So I always ask, where y'all come from? Somebody got y'all here. All right. Okay. I'll leave that alone. Uh, I don't want to make any enemies. <laughs> But we, we originally tried to, we left Memphis because we couldn't take it, it, was, it just didn't fit us. When you come from Detroit, you got a different mentality about yourself. I grew up, I seen black millionaires, whether they was making money legally or illegally. I seen them, okay? And I knew I could be more than what anybody told me to be, I could be. And I just had to apply myself. And, and that pushed me, and that pushed me. And I get into a community where I didn't see that no more, I just, it, it was hard. But God, it's all on God, because I was going back to Detroit. I told my wife, all we need is one job and we out of here. And um, she worked for the state of Michigan at the time before we left Detroit. So she reapplied for the state and guess where the only, the only opening was? Grand Rapids, Michigan. <laughs> so I said, guess what? Guess we going to Grand Rapids, you know? So I went online and did my demographic and said, oh, it is some black people there, you know, all right. Okay, let's go. And um, I got here, and it, it, the community wrapped their arms around us in such a way to where we didn't want to leave. Because we, after only being here four months, my wife was offered a job back in Detroit. She went and interviewed for the job, got it, and we prayed, and God didn't say nothing about leave. <laughs> so we stayed, and we've been here ever since, and we are thankful for it. But these numbers here tells us we need to do something different in our community. Where's our values? Okay, this is what I'm focusing on for the year as strong fathers. We scattered, we went through over 400 different values a person could have, 400, over 400, and we narrowed them down to five that we're gonna focus on this year, okay? Um, and our children are missing those values from a father's standpoint. Again, mom is doing a great job. I would never take anything from a single mother. And my hat goes off to them. I was raised by one, but there's a piece of their life they're not getting anymore. This once was a symbol of rebellion, built on values though. It was built on values. That was a symbol of rebellion. We were rebelling against, we were, well they were, because I was past, that was a little bit ahead of me. They were rebelling against things that were happening in their community that they couldn't take anymore. They wanted something different. So that was once a symbol of that rebellion. And that symbol no longer stands. We got a new symbol of rebellion. And Pastor Troy Evans talked about this symbol. This is that new symbol of rebellion. These kids are rebelling. It's not that they want to disgust you. It's not that they want to make you mad. They're mad. They're angry. And these rebellions are built off of no values. No values. So when you do want to see this young man and just shake your head like Pastor said just earlier, that ain't the answer. Let me tell you. I'm going to pick on some people that are a little older than me. I guess Pastor already set that up. We were already on the same page. It was a failure in, gen in a generation. I was raised off hip-hop. Born in that, I remember when I, I was there when hip-hop was birthed. I could have been a, uh, the nurse that seen hip-hop just come on out. And when hip-hop came out, it was that generation above us that said, oh, I don't want to hear that. What is that noise? What is that garbage you listening to? And I'm pretty sure when the blues came out, hello, if somebody said the same thing to you, okay? So it's the same thing that happened. We, we embraced hip hop and you guys thought hip hop was gonna go away. But this is what hip hop did without y'all. If you would have embraced the hip hop, embraced it and understand it, say, okay, this is a part of my child's life. I'm not gonna change it. I'm not gonna run it away. It's not gonna leave. How do I understand it? 
Help me understand hip hop. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be a rapper tomorrow. I mean, I'm 41 years old this year, and my children love hip hop, and I do too love the old hip hop. I can't get what the, what's happening today, what it turned into. But my original hip hop was built with some values to it. So, but without the values, this would happen to our hip hop. This is when other people get a hold to our hip hop and say, okay, we're going to change it. We're going to make it look the way we want to look since you guys don't want to put your arms around it. Because we know we can make money off of it. So when they decide to make money off hip hop, this is what hip hop turns into. And now they rebellion, they angry, they upset, they frustrated. They're not trying to do anything to, to hurt us. These guys are just mad. And if you, if you think I'm kidding, ask them. And, and they may not say it in their full words, but you got to really listen to what they said in their body language or the way they dress or the way they talk. All right? But it's still not acceptable in my mind because it was something we can do to try to help change it. All right? So we, talking, we talked about focus on five core values. And when I was searching through these values, my, de my director and me, and then uh, I facilitate a discussion group throughout the year, and we were breaking it down because it's hard to figure out what five you want to focus on for the first time out. You don't really want to miss nothing. And you'll be surprised at some things that were values. Sexiness was a value. You know, and I was like, how can sexiness be a value? <laughs> then I went to Facebook <laughs> and Instagram. And you find out some people value the pictures that they post much more than they value anything else. So apparently somebody values sexiness. Sorry, Pastor. I just <laughs> but that, I, I, that one was there. It, it was true, though. I couldn't believe it. Someone actually valued that. Mm -hmm. But it's true. So when we looked at it, we said, all right, let's focus on five. Let's focus on five. The first one, responsibility. Again, responsibility is ours. I'm not telling you got to go out and be the oldest rapper alive today. At 62 years old, you're going to start spitting. No, I don't, I don't expect that. But I do expect you to sit down with, some, uh, with that hip hop generation, that millennium, and try to understand that culture just a little bit. Just a little bit. You don't have to submerge yourself into it. You don't have to be a part of it. You don't have to w dress like they dressed. And although we do got some 60 year olds that do it, but we don't have to walk the way they walk or talk the way they talk. But we need to find a way to bridge that gap. Of same thing Pastor was talking about. It's funny, this is all God. Because I didn't, everything I had planned to say was already planned. And for, him, for Jerry Bishop to come up and say about Nehemiah, he already had Nehemiah on his heart, and the same things he was saying already was on my heart. Yeah. So this is all divine revelation for you, okay? It's all in line. Faith. And you notice that these are the bottom layers of this. This is where you start building that. You start with the responsibility. It's just not my child, you know? It's your child too. Until, um, again, we can say, just like you talked about the lady that sat in the back of the church, said, well, or the children said, well, that's not me. You know, I ain't got to worry about it until it come knocking on your door. Now it's your responsibility. No, it's your responsibility before that. I was talking to a young man, an older man, actually, and um, he told me how many guns he had. I, I got about 45 guns. Let one of them come to my house. And if you get outside that house, you don't need 45 guns. You go in your community. Talk to them. Understand them. Know them. You don't have to wait until it show up to your doorstep. That's being proactive. I'm mean, um, sorry, reactive. You want to be proactive. You want to get out and you want to make a difference. You want to make a change. Okay? So we're going to look at responsibility and we're going to deal with faith this year. Faith is important. If you don't have faith, what else do you believe in? What else can you hold on to? You can't run to God only when times are hard. You need him everywhere you go and everything you do. And that faith goes with you everywhere. He's built right inside of you. So you need the faith. Integrity. It's another thing we, we miss it as a value in our community. Integrity. I, I watched uh, something on the, uh, can't remember what, sh what show it was, but it was a little girl that watched her mother take a pack of gum and stick it in her pocket. And she told me, oh, they ain't gonna miss that. It's only a dollar. Where, where's the integrity in that? You know, so now when a little child goes somewhere and shoplift and go to jail, mom's all upset. Why would you do that? Well, you know, I didn't think. You're not building any integrity. They watch everything we do. Everything. And here's the kicker. They watch what we don't do. So if they see that you don't do anything in your community, guess what they do? 
they don't do. The best way to bridge, and I will go further into this, is when you got this younger generation, let them volunteer at the senior citizen places. Seriously, let them sit down there. That's a bridge. When you put energy and wisdom together, you got the most dangerous thing that you can equip in our community. The energy of the youth, the wisdom of the elders, and you put that together, man, well, who can stop them? But we're sending them out there with energy, no wisdom. The older people are sitting back with the wisdom, with no energy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> respect. Respect. Respect goes two ways. Okay? You want this younger person to respect you, but how much respect do you show them? Because we sit back and say, I, I told, in fact, me and Jerry had lunch the other day. I said, when I moved here and I started doing my work, I'm going to have to tell the truth. I said, well, some people around here wanted me to kiss the ring. I'm from Detroit, I don't kiss rings. I said, y'all don't know what kiss the ring means. When somebody come new to town, you come over and kiss my ring, and then I bless you, and I'll let you go do something. I kissed one ring, and that was Jesus Christ. And when he tells me to go do something, I go do it. And I met a lot of opposition in this community on that level. Now, the love I got, as far as me trying to raise my family and feeling secure with my family, but when I got out and started doing a lot of my work, it was more or less about, who are you? Where you come from? I was once even told that I didn't belong to any of the proper cliques. I was like, well, I got one click. <laughs> it's only one I need. And that's the only ring I'm going to kiss. All right? But respect goes two ways. I'll show respect. I'll, I'll call a Jerry Bishop and ask him for lunch or anybody else. Um, uh, people that I knew were already here. But, and I will tell you, thank you, and I'm here to help. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that type of guy. Anybody know anybody from Detroit? We cut from a different cloth. <laughs> Community, 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 community. That's a value. Walk outside your doors. I walked outside my doors. My wife and I, we were just back home a year ago. And we can, well, no, last week, I'm sorry, last Saturday. And I can honestly say that my city is looking a lot better than it did than when I left five years ago. But the same thing there, the same thing here. All right? You can easily, easily look like a Detroit or a Chicago if you don't wrap your arms around your community. I've been here four years and watched it decline already. And I'm just being real. I went from here, my first year here watching the news, my wife, I fell asleep. They were talking about somebody by Gaston and Myers. I'm like, what? Is that newsworthy? Really? <laughs> that was my first year here in 2009. I don't know what it was like before then, but the, honest to goodness, that was my first night watching the news. They were talking about somebody by Gaston and Myers. I was like, oh man, I don't even worry about locking that door, baby. We just <laughs> go ahead and go to sleep. <laughs> Here I am four years later, now you're looking at it, well, just last year, the, the epidemic of all the murders just happening. And that's just a sign of the times. That shows that a, a community are inside their house with the doors locked and not going out there anymore. Community is a value. Now, you, you guys ain't bad yet, don't get me wrong, because I can ride down my street and look in every house Every window, I can, everybody, everybody on my block has a flat screen TV, and I know it by just looking while I'm driving down the street. It ain't like that back home. <laughs> if you're not invited into a house in Detroit, you don't know what's in there. It was a thing, I was telling someone yesterday about this. Um, uh, it was a young lady I was talking to at Burton, and I was telling her, I said, well, you don't know what it's like when you buy a new TV, you gotta burn the box, because you cannot take that box and put it out inside on the curb. <laughs> All right. <laughs> My mother tell you, you're not about to advertise to everybody we got a new TV. <laughs> and we're not going to have it that long. All right. <laughs> Here, you can put your 52-inch box right there on the curb next to your garbage can and be okay with it. You know, all right? So you're not that bad yet. So let's not get it. Let's not get there. Let's not get there. You got other forces willing to not, willing to not let it get there. Okay? And they're going to lock our children up, try not to let it get there. They're going to hold them back. They gonna medicate them. Ooh, that's one that sticks me. <laughs> they gonna medicate them, dope them up. Every time they say something that don't agree with them, he needs a riddle. Come on now. That was my stint in Grand Rapids Public, so I'll leave that alone. All right. So take take back our community. Wrap our arms around our community. That's the value. And all that, those are the five we're gonna focus on just to get here. Family. 
This is the goal, just to get the family. I'm working on my end, and I got others here in this community working on their end. And again, I thank God for a place like Messiah that gives us all a voice to come here and say, all right, how do we put this together? And I thank God for that. Here are some of the, here are some of the ways that I'm working on this. I mentioned um, dad talk. That's dads all day. I do that six days a week. I just ended a session um, two weeks ago. It'll start again April 24th and it'll run through May 6th. I do it at the Croc Center. Now, I don't like giving out handouts. I don't. But our people don't want to move. Seriously. I don't like giving out handouts. I like giving hand ups. I'm more or less, let me help you up, now follow me. You got any questions, I'm right here in front of you. Tap me on the shoulder, I'll tell you. A handout, that means you want me to pick you up, throw you on my shoulders, and take you everywhere I go, and you still don't want to ask no questions because you have no intentions on doing any of it. All right? So when we get together at Dad's Talk, which is, uh, yeah, Dad's Talk there, we talk about these things. We focus on our values. We focus on how we can change our community. We, I'm doing it at the Croc Center for six weeks, uh, starting April 24th, and it's completely free. And a good thing about when the fathers, when they come, and you can be a young father or a potential father, it don't matter. Um, when we're done, we go work out or we play basketball, and it's all free to you. Don't cost you a thing. Oh, I want to go back to that one. I'm sorry. Y'all forgive me. Because there's some other things on there that I failed to mention. I work with a group called Dad's Count, and they're having their first conference this year on April 19th. Um, uh, I got a brother here named Kyle Hinton. He's part of it as well. And it's our first conference. We're just focusing on fathers. That's our goal. Uh, the fee is $20 for that conference. But we also going to, uh, anybody that want to come, just call us. It don't, even, it don't even matter. We just want people to come there and hear what we got to say. We got Cole Williams as a speaker. Uh, uh, I believe Rondo is a speaker as well, right? And there's going to be a couple guys there that's running workshops and things. It's, it's great. But it's a, it's, a, it's a place where men like myself and other people that are doing fatherly work in the community, we come together, we meet once a month, and we just sit around and talk about how we can make things better in the community. And it's sad it's only like four of us. That's the sad part. In fact, it's more women there than men. In fact, it's ran by a woman. Let me keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but hey, my hat's off to her. She wanted, she wanted to make a change. And it's a white woman. How, how that make you feel? I'm from Detroit. So I'm saying, how, how do that make you feel? And she's a great person. She's a wonderful, her heart is right. All her intentions are golden. But why ain't it a black woman there? If it gotta be a woman, or why ain't it a black man running this? Okay, that's a whole another story, right? Barbershop talk, check with your local barber and make sure that we there. We're talking about these values in barbershops. We have five barbers that are online, that's ready, and we're gonna start that in April. And, we're gonna, and it's all about com creating these conversations. And at the end of this uh, barbershop talk, it's gonna run for four months, and then all, in September, we're gonna hold a summit. And we're gonna talk about what came out of the barbershop, and we're gonna pick one for 2015, and we're gonna work on it together, all right? So check with your barber and see if you're part of it, and not have them give me a call. Um, then I already talked to you about strong fathers, and my favorite is the flag football. I started last year. We played flag, I'm gonna tell you, we had 40 men show up with 30, no, no, 30, what, 40 men show up with 35 children to play flag football. It was fantastic. The little ones played their games, and we got out there and bruised up ourselves and played <laughs> flag football. Please, I, I had never seen so many guys that need some icy hot. And <laughs> but they did it for their children, though. It wasn't about them, it was about the kids, because I'm gonna tell you, I watched me, I, I, I didn't get a chance to play, I, I had to rep, but I looked over at the children, watched these men engage with each other without any weed, drink, no violence, none of that. They watched these men play like little children. Do y'all understand how major that is? When a child, see what I said, when I talk about, they don't just watch what we do, they watch what we don't do. So they watch that we don't engage with each other. You know, they may see two guys sitting around playing a video game, but that's not active. That's not their body in motion. But they watched these 40 men go out there and put their body in motion and play flag football. And it was fantastic. That was my first year doing it. August 31st, which is my birthday. I'm going to do it again this year. My wife said, why your birthday? I said, I don't know. I didn't pick it. <laughs> so here. Here's some pictures 
of the different things we've done this year. Down there in the corner is that flag football. And you can see we had four different teams. Uh, and this is actually my favorite picture that I've ever had because they said this black man don't exist. Come on, people I deal with, people that fund programs like mine, they don't believe this black man exists. Right. Nurturing. He's down, he's tying his kid's shoe. Kid look happy to me. Okay, that's one of my favorite pictures. Here we took, um, we, took a, we took a group of gentlemen and their children to the auto show for the first time last year. And I'm, you know, again, coming from where I come from, that's just natural to go to the auto show. But I found out how many have never, ever been to the auto show here. You know? And someone said, why would you take them to the auto show, Tony? I give them a chance to dream. A dream's been cut off. The older people won't talk to them. You know, the other man want to lock them up and throw them away. So they, they dreams are just nothing. They just waste away behind a blunt, you know? And it's another way young, that men act out and they, 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 they find a way to get away from it. And I just realized this just a couple months ago, sex. It was right there already looming around. This is the way that they go run and hide and then they create more children, okay? So this was a way for them to get out and dream. And I'm gonna tell you right now, every last one of them men who didn't have a job at that time are all working now. Felonies and all, okay? Felonies and all. I told them you can't let a felony stop you. You gotta keep on trying. It, you may not make 10, 12, $13 an hour, but you gotta take what you can get to support your family, okay? Um, so that was that in the flag football, and then I took a group of guys to a piston game in December. Them and um, a couple children. And we talked about values. That's how we start shaping this values thing. We went to the Rainforest Cafe and we uh, went to a piston game. And none of this I charge, it doesn't cost them anything. All they do is gotta show up. Show up to some of the things I'm doing and I'll make sure that they're a part of it. You my, you my, George, my judge Logan today? Okay, great. <laughs> Granddad, you are the link. You are also part of the link. Some of my fondest memories with my grandfather. My, my father wasn't there, my grandfather, the things, the values he taught me are still the same ones I live by today. You are the link. Here's a grandfather that raised the president. That's a grandfather that raised, you see him, little Barack over here on his granddad's head? That's a grandfather that raised the president of the United States of America. You guys are part of it. Bridging that gap. This is where I'm trying to get to. The same thing he was talking to. We got to talk to each other. We got to communicate. You can't just allow it to happen. You, you may not be a father of that child next door to you that's tearing up your lawn. And you yelling out there, get off my grass. That ain't helping him. <laughs> Sit down and let him talk to him why he don't need to be on your grass. Or guess what? Let him get on your grass because it ain't going to hurt nothing. All right. <laughs> Some people looking at me like, yeah, right. <laughs> you better not get on my grass. <laughs> All right, here, real quick. The guy, I don't know, most of you probably know who Warren Buffett is, but that's Peter Buffett. And Peter Buffett said this, and I read this in an article. He said the thing he most, he most admired about his father was his authenticity. That's the value that he took from his father, not the billions of money that his father had. In fact, if you know anything about Warren Buffett, he really didn't give any of his children his money. Most of his money is going to charity. But what he did give, he said the time he spent with his father was the most important thing in his life. And I'm sure the money helped too, but, but he said those values from his father was so a key. And I was gonna show you this video, and maybe I still will if uh, Deacon Hudgens don't throw me out of here real fast. All right. Here's some things that we're doing this year. Again, come be a part of it. I got a table set up. My wife is, well, oh, she's up here now. Say hi. Right. <laughs> she's down there sitting at the table and um, great. And I just want to show a video. It'll take about two minutes. Deacon Husbands, I know he's saying, all right, get this man out of here. I thought I was safe because Judge wasn't here. <laughs>